Well, good morning, everybody. I'm Dick Morningstar. I'm the <coughs> founding chairman of the uh, Global Energy Center here at the Atlantic Council. And on <coughs> behalf of the Atlantic Council, I'm thrilled to welcome you all here today uh, for our CEO series event, uh, a conversation with Barbara Humpton, the CEO of Siemens USA. Uh, we're honored to welcome you here uh, today uh, to discuss <coughs> what I think will be your view of which technologies promise to be uh, the most impactful uh, for advancing energy security, decarbonization, the digital economy, and how in turn these technologies will reshape global business and geopolitics. And uh, I know that you'll also be talking about, because we talked about it earlier, what the role business can play uh, in, uh, uh, in the energy transformation. And the conversation is particularly timely as a cluster of new technologies, uh, artificial intelligence, blockchain, uh, robotics, uh, have the possibility of profoundly reshaping global energy systems and geopolitics. Uh, before uh, becoming the CEO of Siemens USA, uh, Ms. Humpton served as the president and CEO of Siemens Government Technologies. That's sort of an interesting way of putting it, a government technology. Um, <clears throat> uh, she's also served as vice president at Booz Allen Hamilton and Lockheed Martin and uh, started her career at IBM. Um, following remarks uh, from Ms. Humpton, uh, she'll be joined on stage by our moderator, Sherry Goodman, uh, for a conversation. Sherry is on our board at the Atlantic Council, a very good friend of the Global Energy Center, and is also currently a senior fellow at the Woodrow Wilson uh, International Center and CNA, and a, and a senior advisor for international security at the Center for Climate and Security. Uh, and she served as the first Deputy Undersecretary of Defense uh, for Environmental Security from 1993 to 2001. I want to remind everybody that this event is public, uh, it's uh, on the record, uh, and is streaming live. So you can join the conversation on Twitter uh, by following at AC Global Energy and using the hashtag AC Energy. So with that, I'd like to welcome Barbara Humpton to the stage. Thank you, Ambassador Morningstar, and thank you to the Atlantic Council uh, for having me here today. And um, I want to thank all of you all for coming out. Uh, when I was growing up, I never would have imagined that one day I'd be working in national security. I always thought I was going to be a college professor like both of my parents. And in fact, I went to Wake Forest University to study mathematics. Uh, but when I was getting ready to graduate, uh, recruiters from IBM came to the campus and offered to train me in software development. And back in those days, it was a new and emerging technology. Um, so before I knew it, I was part of a team uh, working to help the country end the Cold War. Uh, the projects were classified. I won't be able to share any information about those. But what I can tell you is that <clears throat> there was an experience in that time frame that truly shaped the rest of my career. And it's going to come up a lot in this discussion today. Um, one day, a chief engineer came and gathered several of the programmers together in a conference room and said, I need to tell you a story. These were in the days of conflict in Eastern Europe. And he said there was a fighter pilot who was shot down behind enemy lines. And our technology was used to first locate, and then we were able to successfully extract him and saved his life. And then the chief engineer said, that fighter pilot was my nephew. And it hit me. I mean, that's when it hit me. Our technology matters. So as we think about the technological power that we have today, the big question now is not only how is this going to impact business, we have to ask ourselves, what are we endeavoring to achieve with these technologies? We have to challenge ourselves to use these tools to positively impact people and society. Now, 
fast forward to 2015. Um, I had the privilege attending the National Security Symposium at the Army War College in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, where I learned how we're teaching future military leaders from the US and our allies around the world the tools of global security. DIME, many of you will know this acronym, diplomacy, information, military, and economics. We understand that security isn't just about military strength. It's also about strong infrastructure, job creation, and adding value to local economies. And this is where leadership from the business community is required in order to deliver results. So there are three important areas of focus for Siemens. One is investing in people and skills. You see, the pace of change in technology is accelerating. Many are concerned about the impact that emerging technologies such as artificial intelligence will have on human employment. But the goal of AI, and we like to change the terminology to augmented intelligence, is to augment what humans are capable of. It's not about replacing us. It's about expanding what is humanly possible. AI can help us diagnose, it can help us treat, it can help us understand, but it takes the human in the loop to truly develop the solutions that we're gonna need for the future. So I'm asking fellow business leaders to begin to focus on the human intelligence that we're gonna be needing to drive the systems of the future. The second key focus area is aligning our business with key global megatrends that will impact the world's future. And let's think about this today. One of those is global energy security. One of our core capabilities at Siemens is providing access to reliable power. We know we have the data, we have the software, we have the digital tools to help transition the world to more decentralized energy systems. And if we can make that transition, the benefits will be twofold. One is the opportunity to leverage the dramatic cost reductions in renewable energy, and the other is the opportunity for energy producers, such as the United States, to supply and help build infrastructure for developing economies to gain access to affordable and clean power. That connects to the third priority I want to highlight, which is localization. It's impossible to succeed as a global company without also succeeding locally. As an example, when Siemens launched a mega project in Egypt focused on electricity infrastructure, the mission there had to be larger than transferring technology. Siemens also established a technical education center to train more than 5,000 Egyptian technicians and engineers. And here in the US, Siemens presence has grown from a few scattered contracts 160 years ago to a footprint that is now Siemens largest market in the world. Today, I have the privilege of representing 50,000 employees across the United States, and our company has more than 60 manufacturing, research and development, and digital centers across the nation that serve our customers. And in fact, our global energy headquarters is headquartered in the US as well. We're a net exporter from Siemens to the rest of the world. So we have tremendous resources here in the U.S. We're ready to take on some of the world's biggest challenges, and I'm looking forward to having this discussion with Sherry as we get started today. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Barbara. That was a terrific overview. And, and welcome, everyone, here at the Atlantic Council. Uh, we're delighted to be here. You and I uh, had the opportunity to uh, meet about a year ago out in Las Vegas at an advanced energy uh, technology conference. And uh, it was clear to me then uh, that you were really leading Siemens uh, in a, in a fast-forward uh, direction and that you understood how the company thinks about itself in the larger global security environment. Can you speak a little bit more, your remarks were great, about what are the global trends you see most affecting uh, Siemens today, and then also the role of the company in shaping global security policies? Mm, yeah, great. Um, <clears throat> well, let me start with just framing out for you. Here is Siemens business. 
We are in electrification, automation, and digitalization. Right? We're a large infrastructure company addressing, addressing topics that require know-how in electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, the, the physical world that brings infrastructure to life. And, and look at the megatrends that are affecting the world today. I, I'll start with, with uh, population. You know, the demographics um, around the globe are changing. It's predicted that by 2050, 20% of the global population will be over 60. Right? We're living longer. We're having fewer children on average, depending on where we are. So, so just the shifts in demographics are changing us. And by the way, where are we living? Urbanization is a major trend as well. Looking forward again at 2050, and this is, this is our habit, right? Look, look way ahead. Uh, by 2050, we're going to expect to see 70% of the world's population living in cities. Which leads you to that next question of how are we going to power that? Mm -hmm. So there are huge shifts in the energy marketplace. And oh, by the way, people want clean energy. So that's a major driver for us. And the supply chain that makes all that possible, uh, despite you know, current policies and what we're doing you know, in, in the geopolitics today, what we see is a trend that, that global trade will increase fourfold in that same time period. What's wrapping all of this together then, and what I think is the big mega trend enabler, is digitalization. The tools and techniques that were developed over the last 10 years that we applied to communication and, quite frankly, entertainment, are now making their way into the operational technology, the world we live, the internet of really big things like power plants and train systems, et cetera. So, so you know, those are the five major drivers that are affecting the world that we're addressing. And, and, and I've been sharing with folks, you've heard of B2C companies, you've heard of B2B companies, so companies dealing with consumers, custom, uh, but companies dealing with other companies, businesses. We are a B2S company, business to society. A company that doesn't bring value to society shouldn't exist. So our key questions are, how do we use our know-how? How do we come to work every day bringing the, the talents of these folks who have studied to be part of our world? How do we bring those talents to bear on the things that really matter for the globe? So, um, Barbara, with these trends you've identified, population, demographics, urbanization, and the technology opportunities, paint us a little picture of the vision. What is the, ur what is the urban, er urban area of the future? How is it going to be powered and look different than what we know and live in today? And what should we be preparing ourselves for? Oh, I, this is my favorite topic. But think about. We didn't actually even talk about that. <laughs> think, think, yeah, thank you. This, um, it, think about the city of the future and, and the tools that we have today that could actually enable a different way of living in a city. Um, now, we're, we need to be driven by the objectives of cities and their residents. And cities all around the globe are competing for talent. Have you seen this? They're actually trying to attract citizens who are going to attract the, you know, be, be available workforces for the high paying jobs of the future, then driving economic development, et cetera. So there's a real equation here that revolves around people and their needs. Well, in this new digital world where we have the internet of really big things, now we can connect buildings to transportation infrastructure, to the services that are provided by cities, et cetera. Siemens has developed an operating system called MindSphere into which we can connect operational technology. Uh, the city of San Jose is, has just partnered with us. What they realized is that they have 56 different um, nodes, I'll call them on their network, that they're trying to get interconnected so that the citizens of San Jose will have better access to services. Well, in order to do all that, I'll just say the future is electric. Because cities are also recognizing they want to have a clean environment for their citizens. And how are they going to power this transformation that's taking place? Our prediction is that the, the, the one big factor that's going to really tip the scales in favor of clean and you know, clean power is the advent of the electric transportation. If the city of LA, for instance, chartered us to do a study 
to help them understand how they could meet their sustainability goals. In order to hit their objectives, they have to totally revamp transportation within the LA basin. They need an all-electric fleet. How do you get that? Well, you're going to need a new electric infrastructure, and you're going to need 1,500 times the power that you have today. The electricity, right? Replace all that fossil power with electric power. Man, we've got to come up with new modes of generation. The request from LA is, how do we do that with renewable sources? How do we tap wind, solar, et cetera? All of that snowballs into a discussion that says we've got to have the new technologies that enable intermittent forms of renewable energy to perform well on a power grid. So the advent of storage capabilities, the addition of clean power to provide base load support when at times when the sun isn't shining and the wind isn't blowing, all of those are part of the equation. So that's, as we look forward, a, it's about digitalization and getting connected, and then B, it's about powering that engine. So how, given that future, Barbara, we know that we'll be moving into this electrification era at different rates, right? And there's going to be a, there's a long transition period. In some areas, maybe California will go faster and other areas will go slower, both within the U.S. and globally. How do you think about that and the differences and the fact that um, we're still continuing, um, you know, even as China electrifies, it's still in a major quest for fossil resources? Yeah, it is. Um, well, I, I mean, one of, one of the most important things we've been working on is, uh, you know, regardless of what type of power we're talking about, uh, we've been focused on cleaner technologies. So, you know, fuel efficiency and, and the ability to, to manage and control emissions, all of that is now part of the portfolio. And, and we're actually seeing there's going to be a whole range of needs. It, it all depends on where people are starting from. And you can kind of segment out, um, you know, the, the various, um, the, the various, I'll call them users around the world, right? We've got, we've got developed nations where there's a very strong power infrastructure. And man, just take the US as an example. I, I'm going to argue with the fact that the transition will happen slowly because I, I actually think there's something phenomenal going on. And I'd, I'd love, as we get into q and I'd love to get some of your perspectives on this. Do you remember when we all used mainframe computers? I mean, that was what, that's what the world was like when I got started. And then personal computers were introduced. And fo some folks said, ah, oh, the personal computer, it's never going to take off. And now we're carrying around you know, clothing, toothbrushes that have more computing power than you know, the computers that put a person on the moon. This is happening in energy right now, right? We've got technologies that empower stakeholders to put on-site power generation at their own locations, separate from the grid manage a microgrid or a nanogrid. Don't need to buy that power off the transmission and distribution system. Wow, this is changing everything. And I think the economics are really driving a lot of those decisions and the market even faster than folks predicted five, 10 years ago. Now, you know, so developing countries, different kind of story, right? Mm -hmm. And then think about those, what I'll call energy hungry countries where, yes, they already have a base, like you say, China, they already have a base, but man, they're, they're growing and expanding quickly. Mm -hmm. What we're doing is actually segmenting these problems and looking at them in different ways and looking for ways to satisfy those requirements with a whole portfolio of power capabilities. Right, I didn't so much uh, say it's going to be slow, but it's going yeah. to be uneven and different needs uh, okay, fair in, enough. Different, yeah. in different areas, yeah. which I think you have. Um, Absolutely. You know, right. Absolutely. Um, and um, so when we, you, you know, we're talking about energy, we're talking about infrastructure, uh, energy infrastructure and other critical infrastructure, which is increasingly subject to disruptive events of a variety of types, whether it's extreme weather events, um, regulatory uncertainty or cyber attacks. 
Uh, talk about how we protect our critical infrastructure for the 21st century and Siemens' role there. Yeah, I, <laughs> yeah. I, I think about here in the U.S. the Department of Homeland Security, you know, wrestling with all of those issues, right? Um, and and you know, let me let me start with weather events and. Uh, you know, we've had recent events, uh, the, the issues in Puerto Rico and, you know, seeing how an island reacts after a major catastrophe and the, with, um, with fragile infrastructure that needs to be rebuilt. Uh, we're going to be big proponents of rebuilding for resilience. And what Siemens has actually done is offered up a white paper. Uh, it's been widely shared in Puerto Rico, widely shared at FEMA, um, offering up our suggestions about how to structure a resilient grid for Puerto Rico for the future. Now, you know, what, what we expect is that um, we have a lot to offer, you know, when it comes there, but it's going to take more than us. So what we're working on is creating um, roadmaps that can help stakeholders work together to go build that future. Uh, it, I'll share with you that just a couple of weeks ago, uh, even the fires in California affected us and some customers. We, we had to close down our train factory in Sacramento. And I'm telling you, that train factory is on tight, tight schedules. So filled to the gunnels and everybody working 24-7 to, to meet demands. But because of unhealthy air, we had to, to close the place down. So. Uh, what Siemens is doing is, uh, is basically assuring that we've, first of all, when you have to shut down, you have to shut down. But then in the quick aftermath, the question is, are you ready to respond with uh, support in, in emergency recovery? Superstorm Sandy, Harvey, uh, Puerto Rico, et cetera. This technology that we have on hand for quick startup power um, things that we can do, actually, quite frankly, the microgrid technology that we've been using recently has enabled certain stakeholders to stay running even through um, national catastrophes. Yeah, I'll, a quick story, we had, a, we had a, an industrial customer in Puerto Rico who actually stayed up and running throughout a storm because we had, we had recently, prior to the storm, built a microgrid with them. They had, and what they were able to do shortly after the storm is redeploy all their former backup power generation into the city so that they could support the community. And the month after the storm, they had their busiest month ever in sales. I mean, it's, so resilient power is, is key to all of us. Mother Nature is going to continue to wreak havoc, and we've got to be ready for that. But then we've also got to be ready for what's going to happen with your other big topic, cybersecurity. And cybersecurity isn't anything that a single provider like us can take care of on our own. And, and what we've chosen to do is, is recognizing the fact that we're living within a global supply chain, we're within an ecosystem where information is passed digitally in this you know, amazingly broad um, supply chain that we're in. Um, we've chosen to establish the Charter of Trust. We created a charter that said businesses need to step up and be more responsible because we're living in an economy where if we can't establish trust with our customers, our end users, then we're not going to be successful as businesses. So let's not wait for governments to regulate us. Let's get out there, create a framework that we can all sign on to that first says, we know it's our responsibility to protect data. And we know it's our responsibility to share known vulnerabilities and work together to repair those. So uh, with, with a whole series of tenets around that, uh, we've actually gotten great feedback from the Department of Homeland Security when Chris Krebs was just announced uh, leading his new agency for cybersecurity and infrastructure. In one of his initial meetings with industry, he cited this Charter of Trust as a great example of what the government needs from industry. Well, thank you, Barbara. You've, you've shown that increasingly um, Siemens and other companies are ready to help cities and communities and citizens get back on their feet right. after um, disaster strikes, whether it's the cyber attack or the wildfire or the hurricane um, or sea level rise. What more do you want to do in sort of the pre-disaster 
mitigation area and how do we enable communities now in advance of the next extreme weather event mm -hmm. um, to become more resilient? Well, this is, this is tough. Have you all ever noticed how hard it is to, um, to work with people um, as they deal with the possibility of a negative, right? I, I haven't experienced it, you know, they'll say, I haven't experienced this yet. You know, it's, it's a little bit like, why do I need insurance? Right? Uh, we're, we're busy having conversations with stakeholders about the need for planning. But not only planning, but showing how technologies today can actually be important for, for helping with a resilient posture. And actually, this is a big, important point for cities and communities. Uh, so I'll give you an example, the Lodi Energy Center in California. California, we know, has made a huge commitment to renewable energy, but they've also made a commitment to resilient energy because think about all the, the stakeholders they have who rely on electricity in order to, to keep their, themselves up and running. What they've actually implemented is a fossil power quick startup plant that enables 200 megawatts of additional power on the network within 30 minutes in case of a need. Stories like that are helping community, communities understand what's the art of the possible. And the more we work on these issues, the more we're seeing that there's this nexus of sustainability, economic viability, and resilience. And you're going to find that those of us who are working in this power sector have been working all of those things, and the technologies are converging to give us more capability now than ever. So connected to that, you've, um, uh, Siemens has a commitment to be uh, carbon neutral mm -hmm. by 2020. Uh, 2030. 2030, okay. This, this, Aha, this, I, I even stretched that goal, okay. <laughs> thank, thank you for <laughs> the acceleration. Very, yeah, yeah, yeah. That would be a battlefield promotion right there. Yeah. Um, uh, tell, tell us how you're going to reach that, and from a business and financial standpoint, um, is that uh, how do you think about the um, financial opportunity, or are there any negatives to doing that? Uh, well, this is complicated. It's complicated. Uh, it, Siemens is in 190 countries. And so we've made a corporate commitment globally to this. And so around the globe, my colleagues are, are establishing plans for every single one of their countries. It's really tough in the United States. We're 25% of Siemens business overall. And you heard already the, the footprint that we have. Um, adding to that, uh, we don't necessarily own all of our real estate. We're leasing in many places. Um, we have fleets of automobiles. If you see a white, white vehicle with a Siemens logo on the side of it, it probably belongs to a technician from our building technologies division who's providing support to infrastructure buildings all around, all across the nation, locally. Um, now, and, and think about the carbon footprint that that produces. So we've been through exercises of looking at what can we do in our built space how do we get landlords incentivized to help us convert? And then likewise, how quickly can we convert our, our automobile fleet? And, and I think we've got the toughest job around the globe, but what I've heard are a lot of really cool stories. Now, keep in mind, we are a for-profit business, so we are committed to meeting our shareholders' objectives. But, and, and, and so you know, everybody knows the press of near-term financial objectives. What we're seeing is that many of the projects we're undertaking to build greater efficiency into buildings or you know, a, a different power supply, we're finding that the new technologies make great economic sense. Now, they may have payback periods in the five to 10 year range, but if you're able to think this through and find the right financial partner, you can often find that you get an immediate financial benefit to the organization by implementing these changes. That's exciting. I don't know if we're gonna be able to, to solve the fleet problem quite that easily, 
And, and so I think when it comes to that, we're going to have to ask the hard questions about, do we need to introduce offsets into our portfolio of, of plans to hit that target? You know, are there going to be places where the right thing to do is to recognize that a technology hasn't reached the point where it can help us solve a particular problem, so therefore we're going to make the investment to in other areas that will, will, will help bridge the gap until the time that we're able to be fully carbon neutral ourselves? Mm -hmm. um, right. Well, it sounds like there are some... Um, there are some parallels here uh, and lessons from both weapons acquisition and major capital uh, investment projects that when you if, you, if you take a broader scope on the payback period and you look at the performance available through energy efficient and advanced energy technologies, you actually can improve your performance, which is what the military found in propulsion systems over the last several decades. Bingo. Right. And, and, and the military has been a huge adopter of this concept energy savings performance contracts. You know, this whole idea that take the broader view. Take a problem out of the day-to-day, -day, how do I balance my budget today? And, and ask yourself this question. If I had a budget baseline that says I'm going to pay utility bills like this for the foreseeable future, but instead I can implement more efficient technologies and bring my, bring my utility bills down over time, I can use that delta to finance the project. It'll pay for itself over time out of the savings. And by the way, there are lots and lots of financial institutions in the US right now willing to actually make that investment. So it, it, I think we've got a great ecosystem, financial technology and these stakeholders. It's going to help us really drive that transformation. So let's talk about the, the workforce oh. for the 21st century. I see a lot of uh, young people here today. What's your message for, you know, the, the, um, uh, for the younger generation about how you're going to be successful in the digital economy and what kind of skills do you need? And is AI and all this advanced technology going to put me out of a job or give me a better platform to be successful in the future? Oh, uh, the future is so exciting. And, and let me paint this picture for you. Imagine being able to be your own designer for products that you'll be using through interfaces that feel a lot more like video games than old-fashioned engineering tools. That's where we're headed. That's where we're headed. So today's digital tools allow us to engage with customers in new and different ways. But today we still require pretty hefty technical backgrounds in order to really qualify for those jobs. What we're working on at Siemens is a future where we are able to generate far more what I'll call middle skill jobs. You've heard white collar, blue collar. We're talking new collar jobs where you'd say, hey, this is a combination of the you know, ability to make stuff and the ability to design stuff all in one package. So no more dirty manufacturing jobs that you know, people have this perception that that's what manufacturing is about. Not at all. What we're working on is, A, making manufacturing more automated, more digitized, so that we take the routine jobs, the, the tasks that, are, that, that require a lot of manual labor out of the equation and really take advantage of what humans do best, bring in the creativity. And then you think about today's interfaces for things like if I were to design a car, you know that today cars get designed and it's a, it's a design cycle that literally takes years. We all see concept cars and then five years later we're seeing them you know, in the showrooms. But we're talking about taking the cycle time from design to implementation way down and the ability to do lot size one manufacturing so that we can truly tailor products to the desires of end users. Now all of that is really exciting. How are we going to get there, right? Um, well, first of all, we have to do our job on the technology end. We still need mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, all of that. I, and I hope that a lot of people will still choose to go into those fields. And, and so we've got a big push on getting kids interested in STEM.
so that they'll go into technical careers and, and help us continue to build the strength of the core that creates the physical world that we all enjoy so much. But at the same time, what we're challenging our software developers to do is to make user interfaces more intuitive so that we can bring more people into the workforce of the future and give them roles to play that were previously just unattainable. So when people ask, what should kids study as we go? Mm -hmm. We're having this dialogue right now with universities all across the country because universities are having to ask, what makes me relevant? I, I, I mean, you can't turn to a university as a job preparation organization because technology is changing too fast. There's no way that universities can keep up with the pace of change. What I hope is that universities will become those institutions that give us the, that, that foundation, that learning how to learn that is so important to the workforce of the future. And then we're teaming with networks of community colleges and, and job training programs so that as people progress through their careers, they can keep fresh on what are the technologies that they need to know today. Um, and one more thing, you may know the German apprenticeship model. Mm -hmm. And Siemens has been instrumental in helping uh, bring the apprenticeship model into the US. We're now active as Siemens in nine states. But what we've done is we've created an apprenticeship playbook that we shared through the Department of Labor and Department of Commerce so that others can take advantage of this pattern and, and bring that to life in other industries as well. And we're seeing that actually on the uptake. This is a great model for lifelong learning, right? We learn by doing. So, so um, and, and I'm looking out and I'm seeing a, a real diversity of age in this audience. So I have one other message, and that is we're going to be more diverse in age as we walk into the future. 70 is the new 50, have you heard? <laughs> 70 is the new 50, and, and people really are working longer, and that's a good thing, because the experience people have is important for, for helping us shape the future. But we're also bringing people you know, straight out of high schools into our work environment. And, and I think there's real power in creating multi-generational teams. That's what we're focused on. And, and actually finding ways to engage very capable, experienced employees even longer in their careers. I'm not sure what my next gig is going to be. Okay. So it sounds like your recruiting approach has substantially changed over the last decade. It has to. Um, not, only, uh, not only looking for students in STEM, but also a broader range of universities, colleges, community colleges, and even people coming who haven't taken a normal that's know, right. Track. That's right. And yeah, um, I, you know, let me comment for a moment on one other demographic, and that is people who want to raise families, right? It, it's been a really interesting thing in business over these last few decades where we've seen a lot of effort uh, and originally focused on women. You know, how can we make work life balance work better? And, and so um, at Siemens, we've implemented as many flexibility tools as we possibly can. And I'm, I'm really proud of everything that we offer. But, but boy, I've been starting to change my language because what I'm realizing is that men and women want to take time. They want to have quality time with their families. And what I want people to understand is because the arc of a career is much longer than it used to be, people don't need to stress about, you know, do I have to be in the office and gaining points now? You know, is this going to affect my ultimate career path? My answer is, hey, you know, you can do it all, right? Sequence things in. Take time, you know, have that quality time with your family as you raise them, knowing that you have an opportunity to, to re-engage, re-enter, re-energize with the workforce. Heck, I'm a grandma. And so, you know, now I'm having the fun of being able to take time off and spend time with grandchildren. But it's only because I got started early. I spent those early years while others were climbing up a ladder. I was very content to be busy working on projects. But boy, now I have the chance and, and the experience from having worked on all those projects to engage in a completely new and different way. So that, that's, that's, my, that's my message about 
the, where we're headed as the workforce. So there is life after empty nest. You just got to get a grandkid quickly. I, I, <laughs> if you, you can, can. what transition are if, if, if you can, it's a reward for having yeah, raised teenagers. There you go. That's all I'm saying. Good, good. <laughs> oh, we hope those teenagers are so nice. Yeah. Um, having several of them myself. Yeah. Uh, okay, we're going to open it up for, uh, for questions here. And uh, please identify yourself and keep your question brief. Uh, and uh, we are on the record. And uh, there are microphones, I think, coming around. Becca, okay. I see one hand here uh, on the left, and then gentleman in the middle. I'm Steve Winters, uh, independent consultant. Uh, thank you for a very comprehensive talk. Uh, some, some, uh, much of what you said actually uh, reminds me of what uh, perhaps one of your big competitors uh, has said in, in, in their publications. But it's the, my question is about the, the, the scale and economy. So if it turns out now that one factory, one single factory in Nevada is going to be producing 60 percent of all um, ion batteries, lithium ion batteries in the world, uh, clearly the point of that factory is to get the price of the batteries down as far as humanly possible by using every efficiency. So uh, when you're talking about something on that massive scale, uh, from the standpoint of Siemens, are you working uh, toward any projects which are trying to scale up to that massive uh, level? Are, are, we, are we as Siemens working to um, scale up so that our production is, um, so that we drive the price of production down and, and increase our competitiveness? Is that what you're asking, Steve? Well, I'm just saying, on this gigantic size. So yeah, on the gigantic size, a gigafactory scale. Well, I, let me tell you, I'll describe for everyone the, the Siemens, uh, I'll call it philosophy, that's a big word, uh, for how we establish our global footprint for manufacturing. Um, today, what you'll find is that there's typically a global headquarters for just about everything we do. As I said, energy global headquarters here in the U.S. Uh, but, but for many, it might be a, a global headquarters in Europe somewhere, et cetera. And you'll typically find manufacturing, you know, located in Europe, you know, at, but for just about everything Siemens manufactures, we have manufacturing capability here in the U.S. And then, Often, you will find that there is some other location in the world that is a low-cost center, you know, designed specifically to drive into those markets where the price points are significantly lower, okay? Mm -hmm. So think about kind of three manufacturing capabilities for anything that we might be offering to the world. And further, we do think about this as a global market. So it, it, it's, we're not just simply trying to serve the US or just China. We literally are working to, to serve the world successfully out of these major centers. Now, it's important to keep manufacturing locations full, you know, keep production rolling smoothly. So one of the biggest factors is sheer market effects. And, and so, right, the fact that there are unique technologies that are scarce, scarce supplies, you know, that can drive you to kind of single manufacturing site. But man, for a lot of the customers we're trying to serve, time to market is critical, so we need to be multiple places around the world. Now, watch this space, because manufacturing 4.0 that we've been talking about a lot recently is sweeping the globe. The ability to use the digital economy, the ability to use additive manufacturing so that you can print on site for parts, et cetera, and not have to ship things around the globe, that's becoming far more prevalent. And my prediction is that not for complex things like gas turbines, but for many things that our customers produce for others, you're going to see manufacturing become mm. much more local mm. and much more distributed. Any other questions? Yes. Gentleman here in the middle, and then, and then in the second row. Hi. Um, Elliot Roseman with the United States Energy Association. Hi, uh, I'd like uh, to ask if you could comment on sort of two of the trends that you talked about, and sort of the, the combination of technology and resilience. Uh, I have no doubt that we'll be able to develop new technologies and that we are, and the creativity of Siemens and other companies will be able to create uh, better storage systems and, and microgrids and uh, more resilient systems that we technically will be able to do that. But the question that I have really is how to pay for it. 
Mm -hmm. And you uh, indicated that there's a whole spectrum of different uh, investments that are possible from a business standpoint. But traditionally, when there have been disasters that have taken place, whether it's Puerto Rico or wildfires or whatever, the customers of the local uh, utility have been the ones that have absorbed the cost of rebuilding the system. It seems to me as though there is an economic argument that because we're so becoming so dependent on electricity, that your economy is destroyed as a result, and that there should be others, not just the local customers that pay. What, what should the state be paying? What should the federal government be paying for? And I'd appreciate your comments on how we pay to make the uh, power system more resilient. Yeah, I, I'm really glad you're bringing this up because this is truly one of those big picture items, right? Depending on where you draw the boundaries of the ecosystem of stakeholders, you're going to see different pictures, right? And, and risk and reward moves around in this equation. And so, you know, the, the question is, who's got a motivation to actually make the investment? Who stands to benefit? And so I like the idea of drawing the picture from a societal view and asking the question, what would we have to do in order to make something happen? And this is one reason why Siemens actually tackled the problem of gas to power, right? The way the energy ecosystem has often worked is we've got people who basically extract fuels. We have people who move fuels. We have people who refine. We have people who, you know, and so on and so forth. Every piece of the value chain managed by a different stakeholder and each of them having to manage their own risk and reward. And therefore, you know, it's, it, it actually drives a lot of cost into the system. In addition to that, with the new technologies we have, having more digitally connected assets means that we have the ability to even drive efficiency, to, to know our efficiency at any given time. We can make the, that, that ecosystem more predictable. Less risk means better financing you know, at lower rates, et cetera. So we're working on all of those pieces of the puzzle now. You know, at, at certain times, should governments step in and make these investments? Well, I think we've seen that as a nation before. The United States invested in an, internet, in an interstate highway system. That's everybody's favorite example. We did that, and look what it did for the economy. This is the dialogue that's going on right now. And the question mark is, will there be an infrastructure bill in Congress? Hmm. Great question. Anybody who could answer that reliably, I'm, I'll see you after the, <laughs> the meeting. But, but the, this is a dialogue that's going on. And, and the question I'm asking is, how could businesses get together and make this happen? Thank you. OK. Gentleman here, and then woman in the front. And uh, probably take uh, us close. Grant Mizell, Georgetown University. Thanks for uh, being here in your words today. Um, you briefly touched on security, and then you, uh, you mentioned China uh, briefly. So continuing with themes in, in the news, uh, as we're seeing today, um, a lot of the technologies that you're talking about are moving investment away from traditional capital machines and moving it into intellectual capital. Um, and and uh, it seems that your, your business, your company, uh, is, is taking full advantage of the advancement of intellectual t capital and technology like you're talking to us today about. Um, how are you dealing with the challenges that are coming with the theft of intellectual capital, with the requirements to share that as you go from country to country? The EU is, is a very protective of intellectual capital, and, and as we can see, there are other countries who want that capital. Um, how is Siemens dealing with that? Yeah, uh, thanks for asking that question because um, intellectual capital is core to the success of our 170-year-plus corporation. Uh, this, this, is a, this is a corporation that's founded on the principle of ingenuity for life. Um, you may know that we're spending about $6 billion a year globally in research and development. We're spending well over a billion dollars here in the U.S. And, and so, you know, we actually have a very, very capable legal team that works with us to make sure that we are protecting our intellectual capital. Um, but, but we're also an organization that has a very strong sense that the real power of intellectual property is the ability to continue to innovate. We recognize the risk of losing intellectual property over time, and we have to factor that into our business plans, right? I, I'm not saying we plan for it. I'm saying we understand that is a reality in many regions of the world today that we have to worry about and be proactive about. So to the extent possible, protect it. 
And when it can't be protected, understand what the business ramifications are for that. But keep out inventing everyone. Now, I'm proud to say that in the US, we had the highest growth rate in patents and, and uh, patent applications over this last year. I'm looking at the numbers that are coming out. We, our fiscal year ends at the end of October. And I am proud of the work of the brain power here in the US to keep us ahead of that curve and keep us moving. But, but let's have no doubts. The future is about as a service, right? The future is about Siemens as a service. And so we're all working our way toward that future where what we're doing is solving customers' problems, calling on this background and platform of the intellectual property we bring to the table. Thanks. So if I could pull the thread on that a little bit, because we always hear so much about how businesses, when operating in China um, particularly, um, have, to, um, have to feel the real risk of their intellectual property being compromised. Do you then operate differently in China than you might in the US or in other markets? Do you have a different approach? Oh, yeah, yeah. So just let me make this statement just so it, just to be crystal clear about this. We actually have different approaches to the markets in every region of the world. So I have a colleague in China who, like me, serves as the CEO for China. Right. And, and then his role, his responsibility is to help Siemens understand how best to drive the business in that region. Right, and, and so he understands the business climate he's in. He understands the risks and the you know, opportunities that are, that are ahead for them in China. And, and so the corporation engages with him, just as with me, the global corporation is having a dialogue about how do we set the right uh, business strategy here within the US to really maximize our impact, reach, growth, et cetera. Thank you. Yes, right here. Thank you. Christina Moore, FTI Consulting. Um, first off, you're an inspiration, so thank you so much for being here and, thank and, you. and speaking with us. Um, uh, you mentioned Congress. I was a congressional staffer for uh, 15 years and very much involved in the energy debates, and it's a very binary debate, it seems, um, where one side is very committed to renewable energy and the other side is saying it's just not possible. Like it's, you know, that's great, but it's just not possible. It strikes me in, in the conversation we've had here today that Siemens is very much that bridge, you know, between, um, uh, you know, the, the, the future some aspire to and kind of a practical, you know, here's how we get there. Yeah. Um, my question is, 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 do you think that in today's current climate, which is an interesting one for sure, um, is there an opportunity for Siemens to, to, to get the message out um, and offer um, your, your model and your, you know, um, uh, B, B to S, <laughs> you yes. know, model as, as a solution to kind of change the frame of the debate so it's no longer binary? Um, it, this is probably my number one goal. Right, my number one goal. I'll share with you that as Siemens engages with lawmakers, um, we find that there is tremendous bipartisan support for the issues we care about. I mean, there just is. Is there, is there anyone who is going to argue about energy security? Is there anybody who's going to argue about a cleaner environment? No. Um, and we're fully supportive. It's funny because the, the current administration actually uses a phrase I think we're all familiar with now, the all of the above strategy. The way I used to say it um, in, in, as, I, as I came on board in Siemens and started to understand more about our portfolio and what we do, um, in the energy world, it, I would say if there's an argument, Siemens is on every side of it. Right, because we've got folks who build steam turbines and, and coal used to be the driver for the, the, basically the future of that business. At the same time, we invested in solar and wind. Right, today, we build the largest, most efficient gas turbines in the world. Right? Today, we're supporting LNG, as I say, all the way through the chain. So yeah, pick any issue. Siemens is all around this, and, and we are finding it's a tremendous dialogue. One other thing that we're actually really supportive of is this whole idea of it's okay to get regulations out of the way, right? Today's laws can't keep pace with the pace of change in the technology. So 
you need more companies like Siemens who recognize the, the responsibility to society to actually be in the loop and driving the, and shaping the future. This is OK. So um, we are stepping forward as strong corporate citizens, loud voices for doing what's right for our economy, for our citizens, for the globe. And um, if you can give me any coaching on how to do that more effectively, let's talk after, <laughs> after the meeting. So you see a responsibility uh, of Siemens, a responsibility of companies, a responsibility to prepare for that future that we know is, is coming our way. Oh, I, I do. I, so think about it. Do we need government to tell us and give us all the rules and regulations about how to build the society that we want in the future? I don't think so. I, I think companies do this. I think, I think charitable organizations do this. I think everywhere communities come together, we, in this free land that we live in, have a responsibility to be shaping that future. I mean, think about augmented intelligence as one of those areas where we've got a responsibility to make sure that the way we train our technology reflects the society that we want, doesn't carry forward biases that we might have in our society today. Right? The, these are examples where you'll, you'll see businesses leaning in and really engaging to, to work together toward some of those objectives. Now, is that also accretive to the bottom line? Yes. And, and that's what we're learning over and over again, is that our citizens, <coughs> our communities, our customers are actually asking for that out of business leaders. And it doesn't have to be legislated in. OK. Let's take these last, uh, well, let's take these three questions right here. Do I need uh, to be less long-winded? Yes. Yeah, no. <laughs> Harlan and, and John McComber and the gentleman in the back. And I didn't know if I saw any other Go hands. OK. Now going back to your comments about the need for additional substantial additions to the electric uh, power system, which obviously translates into the generation of electricity. And uh, looking at the, or taking your example and then applying the numbers that we all know about the kilowatts that are going to be needed in the, not just the immediate, but for over the last five to ten years. The question I have is realistically, can we find any way for businesses to be promoting other sources of that supply other than natural gas? Uh, we, uh, high, uh, atomic energy, we have some political problems. Coal, we have also some political problems. And if it is natural gas, uh, what is the role of business and local community uh, people who design the price structure of what that electricity is going to cost? How can we really get this, these, uh, the old power plants converted as quickly as possible with anything other than natural gas? Hmm. OK. And why don't we take Harlan's question as well and then answer them. Uh, Barbara Harlan, Ullman, good to see you again. Good to We're see trying you. to team with Stevens in New York, as you know, with Con Ed. Um, an answer and then a question. Infrastructure bill, no. <laughs> Freedom caucus, yes. And we can think about it, I'm afraid you're going to get as much money that's being spent right now on the margins, and it's a national tragedy. My question is this. Uh, in 1980, CSIS came up with a report saying the number one critical vulnerability of the United States is the electrical power grid. 1980, unless we fix it in five years, we're toast. It's gotten worse. So what technologies do you think Siemens has to strengthen and reinforce the electrical power grid, if any? And second, uh, there's a report coming out of the Department of Defense exactly how vulnerable we are to cyber. What are you doing in terms of your security? Uh, let me put it this way, Stuxnet, next, which took out the, uh, the, Iraq, the Iranian centrifuges on steroids is what we're facing. So what is Siemens also doing in terms of protecting the even more vulnerable power grid? Great, great, okay, so thanks for teeing that up. Um, it, power generation, right, how do we drive more forms of power generation, uh, right? There's, uh, and incidentally, I'll just share with you my, I have a secret passion 
for reinvigorating the already existing hydroelectric infrastructure of our nation. Mm -hmm. and, and that turns out that's a tough thing to do too because of the stakeholder, you know, who owns what motiv motivator, you know, in the whole system. That, it, set that aside for a moment. Um, natural gas is going to be actually a great part of the answer because we are going to have more renewables coming onto the grid. It's just going to happen because people have those assets. It's, it's cash in the attic for them that, that they have natural resources close to wherever their production, wherever their need is. They're going to be bringing that on with storage as it now becomes available. But natural gas is going to be that, that uh, what I'll call the safety net that allows us to ensure that we have the base load that we need across the grid. Now, move from power generation then into the transmission and distribution. Yes, Siemens has been working on, on actual new digital tools that are helping us in the arena of managing the overall flow of electricity across the grid. And the work with Comet is an absolutely fantastic example of actually creating a microgrid. You know, a, a, a utility investing in tools that are going to provide for greater resilience and, and serve their community more effectively. So we're having additional tools come online. Now, I just said digital. What does digital imply? The flip side of digital is the cyber risk. And so uh, over the last several years, we've actually built a cyber team of over 1,000 cyber professionals around the world in our very first focus areas, you know, we've got healthcare, we've got transportation, we've got modern manufacturing. We've, the place we've chosen to focus our attention in these early moments is, is in the power generation and transmission and distribution arena because of the criticality of that need. So uh, if you, uh, you want to look more into this, I'd suggest that you look for us, Cyber, Siemens and Cyber, and power, and what you'll find is the offerings that we have for both monitoring as well as remediation of cyber threats on the grid. And, and actually, we're working in partnership with utilities all across the nation. OK, we'll take the last question. And, uh, I know you've got to go. Yeah, yeah. The Atlantic <laughs> Council relies on board members to make sure <laughs> that the organization runs well. And Sherry is one of those board members. So should we, should we allow you to go to your next meeting? Well, um, I'll, I'll, you how, should, but I, I, be I don't want to deny this, this person. I'll stay here and answer question. one more we question. We have a finance committee meeting next door, and I looked. I got the look like if you you're sure not did. there, we don't have a quarrel. When the ambassador brings out the hook. This, we need to keep this organization going. I'll answer so, one more question, and then, okay. we'll, and then we'll break up. OK. Barbara. Thank you, Sherry. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Fred Ranke from Denton's. Um, yes. I was curious about your views on autonomous vehicles, where that's going, what role Siemens plays in the whole process and along the supply chain. And uh, then also a few words maybe about what parts of the world are taking the lead. Is it in the US? Is it China? And where you see that uh, moving forward over the next decade or so. Yeah, yeah. And, and Siemens has a huge emphasis on this globally, and it's exciting. We're working at this from a couple of different areas. One, research and development in autonomous systems. That's important. Right, what does it mean? What does autonomy mean? And how is, how is the future going to work? Um, the second thing is an interesting new acquisition that we made where we actually have created um, a, a simulation environment for testing out autonomous driving software from vehicle manufacturers. I mean, how many road miles do you need to actually prove out the technology? It turns out you can do a whole lot of testing in a simulation environment and get literally millions of road miles before you ever put a vehicle out on a physical road. Um, I, I, you know, so, so on and so forth, right? This is, this is an extremely exciting area. And what you'll see is that car manufacturers in the US are all working on this. We are working with all of them, or I'll just say as many of them as we possibly can, because this has applications to so many other things, right? If cars can be autonomous, what else? Um, and, and, and it is the future. And then I will say, as the grandmother who wants to keep working well into her 90s, 
did, did everybody hear that? Well into her 90s. Um, I am relying on that self-driving car to, uh, to take me to my future job. Uh, but uh, you know, who's leading? Uh, yeah, there's interesting work going on around the world. Um, what's fun is to see certain cities. You know, the Dubai Expo is coming up. Siemens is the, is the technology partner for the Dubai Expo. I'm kind of curious about whether we're going to be seeing some of this there. Uh, but what you may have also seen is the grants that have come out of the Department of Transportation here. I believe that we have the opportunity to be world leaders in this technology with this close collaboration um, in government, regulation, and, and the technologists who are bringing this to life. Very, very promising. Thank you. Well, I'm going to just um, I, let me close this now by saying <laughs> I've, I've dismissed all of my, uh, all of my uh, supervisors. And we are now a self-managed seminar. And thank you all. It's been wonderful to be here with you today. And I look forward to just having some offline conversation. Thanks.